The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. May the Spirit of the risen Christ be in our minds and in our hearts, that the wisdom of the Gospel may penetrate the depths of our life. The crowds asked John the Baptist, What should we do? He said to them in reply, Whoever has two cloaks should share with the person who has none. Whoever has food should do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. They said to him, Teacher, what should we do? He answered them, Stop collecting more than what is prescribed. Soldiers also asked him, What is it that we should do? He told them, Do not practice extortion. Extortion. Do not falsely accuse anyone and be satisfied with your wages. Now the people were filled with expectation. All were asking in their hearts, whether John might be the Christ. John answered them all, saying, I am baptizing you with water, but one mightier than I is coming. I'm not worthy to loosen the thongs of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hands to clear the threshing floor, to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Exhorting them in many other ways, he preached good news to the people. The Gospel of the Lord. In many ways, I think the season of Advent is the most paradoxical of all the Christian Catholic. Uh, annual celebrations, liturgical celebrations, maybe not surprising because it's meant to prepare us this year to celebrate this year, to enter with whatever way we're ready this year by the grace of God, to enter the mystery of the great paradox, the, the, most, the most remarkable, you know, terrifying, if you will, I don't know, the good adjective for it here, paradox. That is to say, to celebrate, to enter into the reality, the truth, the mystery, the consequences in my life of someone who was both God and man at the same time. To celebrate, to enter into the mystery of the incarnation of the divine word. The reason I say that the the season is paradoxical is that you notice that it's filled, I mean, today especially, it's filled with references to joy, to peace, to comfort, to excitement, to delight, but we're dressed in purple. It's a feast, that is to say, it's about conversion, it's about repentance. Pretty paradoxical. It's a feast that psychologically and in all kinds of ways, liturgically and certainly in our culture, is a feast all about preparing to celebrate the birth of Christ, to celebrate the feast of Christmas. But most of the readings are about the end of time. So that is to say, it's a paradox in the sense that it looks like a feast celebrating something that already happened, rejoicing in something that already happened, but it's actually a feast about living in view of something that has not yet happened. So it's, so the tension is in the way we prepare for this feast. And you probably notice that the readings don't vary very much from one week to the next. And I think it's because they're all circling around the central paradox. And it's that which I want to reflect with us all about uh, this morning. And I thought the best way to do it is by asking two questions, which were actually the things out of which I constructed this homily. So you'll have some idea where, maybe, where I think we're going here. And the first question is, why is it, that thing that I just mentioned, why is it that the feast which is supposed to be a feast about, and it's a preparation for a feast about something that has happened about the birth of Christ, the coming of God into time, why is it, why does it try to make us concentrate on the future coming of Christ? The prayers are all full of that. The first prayer was full of that. When he comes, will we be in joy? Why, does, why is that? 
The second question is about the gospel reading. And it's the thing that struck me first when I was preparing this. People go to John the Baptist, it's about conversion, right? There's all through Advent, it says you have to repent, you have to repent. By repent, it means change the way you think about things. Change what you see. Change your mind, your inner mind. It's all about conversion. So they go to him and they say, okay, as Luke presents John the Baptist here, the people come to him and say, okay, how do we convert ourselves, excuse me, for this? How do we change? And he gives them really the most pedestrian, banal of answers. There's nothing striking. I mean, any decent anybody would say, look, if you have more than you need and somebody else needs it, give them to her son. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Use your job. I mean, it's, the pre- it's really odd. And then he ends with this, well, Luke has to end, with this strange thing. But there's one coming after me who will convert you with fire and the Holy Spirit. That struck me. Why does Luke put these two ethical demands? Why are the ethical demands on the one hand so obvious, if you would, on the other hand so mysterious? I just want to think about those two questions for a little bit in the light of what it means to live Advent in preparation for for Christmas. The first one, the first question, has everything to do with the heart of the mystery of Christmas. What do we celebrate when we celebrate Christmas? We celebrate that unique Christian belief, the incarnation of the divine word. We celebrate, we contemplate, we think about, we try to understand and see what difference it makes in my life that eternity entered time. Eternity, not endless time. That's not what eternity means. Eternity means no time. When we say God is eternal, we mean that God is completely God, if even in bad language, in an instant. He's just, he doesn't, there's no change or the coming and going of God. There is no time in God. We're celebrating a feast where eternity became identical with human time. And it should pretty obviously follow from that, that human time changed. And that's what I want to think about. What is this change in human time that comes about when we believe that this, that the Divine Son became this infant and lived a human life? It has to do with human time itself. There are certain things about human time that we all know but are worth recalling right now. And one, and maybe the most poignant of them, is that we do exist in time. That is to say, we exist spread out over time. I never exist all at once. I did exist for a long time. There's a past, all of you. We have some past, long or short. I exist in a kind of presence, not instantaneous, but a present from months or years. And I may exist in the future. It's, I will die, too. We will all die. That is to say, we are not only spread out among time, but we only have a limited amount. That's why we say over and over again that time is the only perfect gift, because it's the only thing you don't get more of. You give somebody your time, you're giving it yourself. Give money, you can get more money. Give food, you can get more But Give time, you're giving away you know, something that you only have so much. So I never can say to somebody, this is the easiest maybe image of this we have. It's the ordinary experience of human love. A woman cannot say to a man, I love you completely, because she doesn't exist completely. Even our ideal, I will love God with my whole heart, my whole mind, is not something I can do. It has to be, it has to be saying something about the whole story of my life. But go back to, I can't love, I, you know, two people who begin to love one another or love one another, they always want to know about the past because it's not there anymore, although it is present in many ways, and that's why the gift of forgiveness is so important in living human time. But that's for a whole other talk. They want to know about one another's past. They can say to you, I love you now, if it's true or partly true. They can't say, I will love you in the future. They can say, I promise to love you in Germany. In some way, they give the gift of the future, mysteriously, especially in the sacrament of marriage, but they can't actually give it. 
So we are spread out across time, and it's one of the most poignant things about human life. But it's not only that our life moves in a direction toward, you know, toward the conclusion of that life, it's a story that goes through, but it also repeats, it circles around. I mean, the things have happened over and over again in my life, just like school years go round and round, and liturgical years go round and round. They don't stay on the same level. They round, they change. I come to this Advent, I'm different from last Advent, I'm from 30 Advents before that. So it's a kind of spiral, but it's still this, this sort of movement. Now, what difference does it make? That was very brief, but I hope it's enough so that you get the point. What difference does it make that eternity entered time? What difference does it make to human time? The difference it makes is that one individual man, who lived, because he was also God, lived this whole human life and reached the completion of human time. So that, this is what we believe, all of human history, everything of every human life, of the mind boggling, you know, of these billions of human lives, every human life was in a way, present in this man when he lived, died, and rose and brought human life into eternity. So in a way, the completion of human time is already real. But it's still going to be lived out, become real in the lives of individuals. So what happens to my time? these individual moments of my life in light of the birth of this baby who is also God, who lived life, died, rose, and brought all of that. Well, what happens is that the future is present. Jesus, the risen Christ, comes to me from the future. He comes at me from the future. This you know, it's the thing I say often at the end of Mass. I live, now not I, but Christ lives in me. My life is not just my story anymore, or potentially. So this accomplishment of time, this incarnation, which was not just an instant, but was this whole story of his life, this incarnation is, it exists in God, but since God is everywhere, God is in Christ, is in the moments of my life, it is also present in the moments of my life. And so, we come to conversion. Change my mind. Change the way I look at time. Change the way I experience the moments of my life. That is to say, what would it, how do I live this, this day, this week, this month, this time of my life, with Christ, with the incarnate, transformed divine son. What's the connection between my mind, my body, my experiences, my failures, my hopes, my joys, my punishment, the politics? What's the connection between all of that and what has already happened in Christ? That can sound very remote, partly because there's no way to describe it until you begin to live it. And it will be different for each of us in some ways, because we live somewhat the same, somewhat different. I mentioned last week, and I think, you know, there's an imaginative way to do this. It's just imaginative. But each day in prayer, especially in Advent, I think about some part of my life, something that's happening, exams, you know, something like that, some experience, falling in love, having troubles, whatever, some part of my life. And I think, I imagine Jesus saying to me, let me live this with you. It's just imagination. But if it's an imagination that sits still, I may begin to change my mind about what I see in the time of my life. So that's the first thing. The incarnation changes human time. And that's why talking about the birth of Jesus, we never talk just about the baby. We never talk just about the crib. We always talk, oh, he came, he's coming. He's coming now. He will come. That's why it does that to human time. The second one, just very quickly. This story of, of the way Luke presents John the Baptist. You know, it's really interesting. I mean, John the Baptist, the people come to him and say, okay, we want to be converted. We want to think differently about the way we look. And as I said at the beginning, he says to them very simple stuff, you know, stop cheating. You know, and remember, these were soldiers. These were Jewish soldiers who were working for Jewish, uh, king, you know, uh, 
political officials. He just says to them, you know, be decent, don't beat up on people. He says even to the, uh, the people who collected the taxes, they did it as a kind of franchise. So they'd buy the franchise and they had to pay so much for the franchise and anything they made over that was cream. So they would take a lot over that. And he would say, well, no, just, you know, just be reasonable. It's very, you know, sort of obvious stuff. In more dramatic ways, it made me think of Albert Camus, you know, the man who said, what is it like to live like a human being where there's no God? And he came up with this really profound human ethics, very admirable ethics, and the courage to live that ethics without God. It's a little bit like fear. But, but is that the conversion? I think actually not. And that's why Luke tells this story in this interesting way. He tells you, you of course you should do those things. And there's a way of doing those things which just locks you in human life. And there's another way of living those things, of being decent, sharing what you have, or, you know, or being part of something. There's a way of living that that opens you to the mystery of the incarnation, infin- eternity into time, infinity into, into us. And that's he describes as he will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. And the simplest key, so that we're not going to be talking until tomorrow afternoon here, the simplest key to that is, I think, in the reading that says over and over again, God is in our midst, God is in our midst. There was a novel that I was reading during the week, and there was a line in it that was really impressive that said, love is the, he's talking about human love, he's talking about a young man who loved a girl who didn't love him. But he said, love is the only thing that connects one thing to everything else. Love is the human love, and that's true. Love is the only thing that connects one thing to everything else. This is infinite love. In your midst is infinite love. That is to say, in our midst, because Christ is in our midst, because he became the hand of life. In our midst is the inner reality of the life of God. Not just being good, not just being decent, but actually in some way loving my love penetrated by God's love. My love, not just with Christ, but Christ, I live, now not I, but Christ lives in me. What would my life, life be like? What would the time of my life be like? The days of my life? as I gradually become more and more aware that in our midst, in the midst of my own life, but in our midst together, there is infinite love. The one thing that connects everything, connects everything to everything else. So that's Advent and Christmas. Today is the Eucharist. The stuff I've tried to talk about, probably pretty inadequately, in the next 20 minutes, everything about all the Advents I've ever lived or will live, all the Advents you've ever lived, all the Christmases you've ever lived or will live, all inner reality and meaning of it becomes present. Divine Son became man and becomes really present here with this gift of himself to his Father and his gift of, and the Father's gift of his Son to us as the food of our true life.